Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. My name is Sarish Sajjad and I'm a faculty member at the Khan University School of Nursing and Midwifery, Pakistan. And I'm also the academic lead for the master's program at uh, AKU School of Nursing and Midwifery. With me, uh, there are two more members. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Laila Ladakh. She is the associate professor and the assistant dean for the graduate programs at AKU School of Nursing and Midwifery, and also has a joint appointment with the uh, Department of Pediatric and Child Health at AKU. Uh, I also have with me Ms. Neveen. She is our assistant manager for the graduate program. Um, I will be moderating this, um, uh, this webinar and um, we'll move ahead in, in a couple of minutes. So this is um, uh, one of the webinars from a series of webinars that are organized by the School of Nursing and Midwifery Pakistan. Uh, and today's webinar is on intersection of generative AI and uh, nursing. And we are very uh, happy to see such an overwhelming response from, from our students, uh, faculty, staff, healthcare providers, not only from uh, Aachen University, but also from other universities across Pakistan. So we have received almost 500 and plus registrations and people are joining in. So let me introduce uh, our warm audience, uh, our speaker, distinguished speaker for uh, this webinar, uh, Dr. Liesbeth van Balk. She is a postdoctorate researcher at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Her research focuses mainly on the end of life care and adults with congenital heart diseases. And her insightful work bridges the gap between uh, cutting edge technology and compassionate nursing to enhance the healthcare delivery. Um, she has done a lot of work on how uh, technology can be tied together to improve the nursing profession as well as patient care. Uh, some of her work also revolves around the value of chat GPT, which is a buzzing word these days, and how it is being used for uh, patient care and for nurses as a whole. So uh, before uh, handing over to you, Dr. Liesbeth, just um, a small announcement for our audience. Please do ask questions, but post them in the chat box. Uh, we will entertain all your questions at the end of the webinar. And uh, we would also be sharing with you um, a Google link for the uh, session evaluation. Please do fill in that form as well. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Liesbeth, and thank you so much for joining in today. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. That's great to hear. Uh, and thank you so much also to to Dr. Ladakh for uh, for the invitation to uh, to talk to you today uh, about this topic of generative AI for nursing and and patients. Um, and indeed, I see it's a number of people that are joining today. Uh, that it's a topic that that needs to be discussed. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, that I have the chance to do that with uh, with you today. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging my supervisor and my colleague um, Philip Mons, um, with whom I made this presentation and with whom I did a lot of the research that I will discuss with you today. Uh, so therefore, I'd like to uh, to acknowledge him here um, as well. There is nothing to uh, to disclose. So November 30, 2022 is the day that the revolution of generative AI started. Um, it is the day that ChatGPT became publicly available for free. And so it is the day that a lot of people got to know what generative AI is and got to actually use it uh, themselves. I will be talking a lot about ChatGPT. I know that there are also a lot of different tools um, for uh, generative AI to, uh, to use. We'll be discussing this a little bit, but the main focus uh, will be uh, ChatGPT. Um, I'd like to sometimes take a moment to see and create a little bit of an interactive moment to see, are there people in the audience that have not heard of ChatGPT before? Uh, maybe there are people in the audience that are using it on a daily basis. Um, but I see that we are way too many today to actually have such an interactive moment. So I will try in my presentation to cover a little bit um, something for everybody. 
Uh, I will start by briefly introducing ChatGPT, and then uh, afterwards I will uh, explain a little bit more into depth uh, possible applications and also possible limitations of this tool for, um, for nurses and other healthcare professionals. So I assume that most of you have heard of ChatGPT before, but for those who have not, here is a short uh, introduction. So ChatGPT stands for Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer, and it is an artificial intelligence language model that has been developed by OpenAI. It is trained with a massive data set of written text up to September 2021. Um, a massive data set, you can take that very literally. It is actually trained on whatever written uh, text there has been on the internet uh, that has been put in ChatGPT uh, to train the skills. Uh, up to September 2021. So information that has been uh, put on the internet after September 2021 has not been um, used to train uh, ChatGPT. So ChatGPT generates text. This is a little bit technical. How is this done? Um, it uses a probabilistic language modeling approach. Um, so it actually looks at to create a sentence at the words that is most likely going to be the next word in the sequence. And that way it builds sentences and it sounds very, very, uh, very good. It actually really sounds as if a human would have written this, uh, this text. ChatGPT can be accessed in two ways. Um, the most well-known is a web-based uh, user-friendly version, which is just your version when you um, when you go to the website and you can interact with ChatGPT. Um, most people will actually uh, use this version, but there is also there is also an API, so an application programming interface, where you can do more programming and more uh, customization um, of the tool. The technology that is behind ChatGPT or generative AI in general is natural language processing. So natural language processing is actually the technique that is used to process and analyze large amounts of language data. It's really the interaction between the language, text, and uh, the computer. And here on this slide, you can see a couple of examples um, of natural language processing in general. Uh, this uh, technique, this branch of artificial intelligence is used, for example, for speech recognition, uh, for virtual health assistance, for extraction of cardiovascular information from unstructured uh, discharge letters, as well as to identify symptoms or substance use from clinical notes. This use of natural language, uh, this uh, branch of natural language processing is only one branch of um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, as you can see here in this figure, there are also other branches that might be interesting for uh, nursing, such as, for example, the branch of robotics, which is the design and building processing and use of robots, uh, machine learning um, in general, or deep learning. This figure uh, is coming from an article uh, that we have written about a year, a year ago about the use of artificial intelligence uh, for nurses. So it goes a little bit broader than, than only the use of natural language processing and ChatGPT. Um, here is a QR code that will lead you to the article. So if you would like to read a little bit more, uh, you can scan this, uh, this QR code um, and read more uh, about the general applications of AI for nurses in this article. Okay, back to ChatGPT. So the question is, what can ChatGPT do? Uh, and whenever there is such a question, um, Today, my first reflection is, let's ask ChatGPT. So we did that and we asked ChatGPT, what can you do? And it says, okay, I can do a couple of things. I can do language translation. Um, and I actually think it is very proficient uh, in language translation. Uh, my mother tongue is Dutch and I speak a bit of French and I use these languages as well as English and ChatGPT. And I think that works very well. Um, I know that maybe for uh, languages that are less well used or for which there are less sources on the internet, uh, language translation cannot be as proficient. Um, but in general, I think that ChatGPT does that very well. Text summarization, that is also definitely something that ChatGPT can be used for. Uh, it can very well, if you, if you give it a text, shorten it down and, and take the key points out of it. It also said I can also do question answering, and that is true, but 
according to me, only to a certain point. It is indeed the fact that if you ask a question, it will give you an answer. However, it is not really um, a search engine. So it is not really designed and set up to really create knowledge and to be really a knowledge base. Um, so that's why I agree with this, but only partly. A couple of examples of ChatGPT uh, or the application of it or chatbots, uh, automatic writing, content creation, and uh, language understanding for AI applications. We will be talking a little bit about that uh, in today. So uh, costs, as you might know, um, the version that is freely available uh, via web interface is uh, GPT 3.5. So that one you can just access for free. And then there is ChatGPT 4, which is a, a, a model that has been trained a little bit further, which is also accessible, but it's costing uh, $20 a month. And if you pay that, you have a couple of new features available. Um, they also say that you have access during peak periods, false response speeds. Um, I'm, I'm using it right now, and it's it's actually nice because you, ha you can have a couple of plugins with, for example, PowerPoint and Canva. And you can do a couple of more um, more things with this uh, with this ChatGPT four version. Um, of course, what is also very important to to discuss um, is the limitations uh, of large language models or, or ChatGPT. Um, the first one is something that I have already mentioned. Um, it is not a search engine. A lot of people have been saying, will ChatGPT or other large language models replace uh, search engines like Google? I think the answer definitely is no. Um, this are, these are two different things. Uh, ChatGPT is not really built to, to really look up information and to be a search engine, which Google um, and other um, tools definitely are. Um, it's not indicating where the provided statements are based upon, um, which is really a, a very important uh, limitation as well. So it will give you information, but it's not really saying which references uh, it has used to obtain that information. And this, of course, is, is a very important one for healthcare and for applications for nursing, of course. Uh, you want to know if, if, a, if a nurse looks up information or if a patient looks up information using ChatGPT, where this information is, uh, is coming from. And as I have already mentioned, um, it is trained up to September 2021, so there is no knowledge of events that have occurred after this period in time. Another limitation is that it can create bias and offensiveness. The responses are not always neutral. Um, they are making advancements in there. They're really trying to train the model to be as neutral as possible. But however, it is trained, as I said, on information from the internet. And as we all know, the internet is not neutral at all. Um, so the answers that ChatGPT will provide are not neutral either. And there are also certain people that are trying to use uh, certain prompts and really trying to um, to uh, to create offensive answers, uh, and and they they succeed in that. So I think there is also a long way to go there to try to make it uh, as neutral as possible. Um, the next limitation is that it cannot produce novel ideas or concepts. So ChatGPT is really basing itself on something that it has learned. So there should be an example of something first before ChatGPT can create or can reproduce. Uh, so it cannot really come up with very creative or original ideas um, or only to a limited, uh, limited extent. And then I think uh, one of the most important limitations um, are the hallucinations. Uh, so what's a hallucination? It's a plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answer. It's actually an answer that ChatGPT is making up because it doesn't really know the answer, but it will produce something that is kind of plausible. And uh, one day I ran into this situation. Uh, I was looking up information on the concept of illness identity, which is a concept that I'm performing research on. And all of a sudden it says, oh, but I have some very interesting information about this concept in this source, Van Gogh et al. So I'm like, okay, so that's my name. So it's very strange that I'm looking for information that I have not seen before. 
So I asked it, can you provide the full reference that you were just referring to? And this is what it answered. I said, of course, no problem. I apologize. Here it is. And so this is a reference that is starting with what seems to be my name, because that is my last name and my first letter, two colleagues of which I have never worked with, but that are working in the same field. So it could be very plausible that I have actually worked with them. A title that sounds very interesting and nice. It is published in the, in the journal Cardiovascular Nursing, which is very plausible as well. It has a volume number, a year, and even a DOI. So I saw this and I thought, how could I have missed this? It's a publication in my field of interest published by someone with my name. Of course, this is non-existing. This reference does not exist at all. Uh, it just made up something because it thought that this would be a plausible answer. The DOI number is, is an existing one. You can, you can find it, but it's of course linked to a different article. Um, so this is something that I would like to, sh I wanted to show you because it shows us that we should be really, really careful um, with just taking the information uh, that you get from uh, ChatGPT for granted. I heard uh, someone giving me the advice and uh, this person said, actually, you should think of ChatGPT as a six-year-old. You ask this person to give you some information to write it down. It's sometimes a good start already, but you always have to be very reflective and say, okay, what what in is is true? What in is is just made up? And just try to work from there, uh, which I think is a is a nice advice. So let's be careful. I just said uh, something else that we should be really careful with our privacy issues. Um, we know that it's very dangerous just to put patient information um, in ChatGPT uh, because that's sensitive and confidential data. Um, this is this is not secure because OpenAI uh, is actually using this using this data and using this information to improve their systems. Um, so it's really really not a good idea to to just uh, add patient data um, into this system. Um, so this is something that we'll have to uh, be careful with and also be be thinking about in the upcoming years to find solutions uh, for this uh, for this issue. As you've heard, I've talked a lot about ChatGPT so far, but there are a lot of similar projects. Uh, this list is, uh, is not complete. Uh, Google Bart, uh, P and Eliza will be talking about a little bit later on. Uh, MetaLama, Baidu Ernie Bot, uh, or similar uh, large language models. Um, and then there are also search engines that are using generative AI, such as Nubing, uh, which is actually providing you references for uh, the answers that, that it's giving. Uh, Google Bart, uh, there is ChatGPT with a browser plugin, there is perplexityu.com. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, feel free to just play around and have a look at these websites. Um, they work very similarly, um, but sometimes for one application, it's better to use a certain um, tool than for, uh, than for another. Okay, so then let's focus on, on the question that I actually would like to answer together with you uh, in this webinar, uh, which is what are current and future applications of generative AI for nurses and for patients? What can we use this technology for within our um, nursing research and nursing practice? And as I told you already, when I have a question like this, what my first reaction is these days is, let's ask ChatGPT. So I asked ChatGPT, um, what do you think can, uh, why do you think it can be of value for the cardiovascular nursing uh, profession and the allied health profession? Um, and this has been published also in an editorial, um, which you can uh, find using this uh, QR code. It gave an answer, of course, it always does. Um, it said I can be of, of a big value uh, and here is why. Uh, in clinical practice, I can generate patient education material. Um, I can do automatic charting and documentation uh, from structured data. I can generate medication lists and instructions uh, for patients. I can keep up to date with the latest research and guidelines by summarizing articles in a concise and easy to understand format. I'm just telling you what ChatGPT told me. Um, I'm not telling you what I entirely agree with. Uh, for example, this point, I do not entirely agree with. Uh, keeping up to date with the latest research, I have told you it has information until September 2021. So 
but that's that's over two years ago right now so it will not give you any information on guidelines that have been published or recommendations within the past two years so i'm not sure whether it's really whether we can really call it up to date and also i've told you it's not really actually set up to find uh, knowledge knowledge generating or to find information so i'm not entirely sure with this one um and then language translation to communicate with patients who speak different languages. Um, I think that that's a good one too. Okay, so look at, let's have a look at a couple of, uh, of examples of uh, the use of GPT or other um, generative AI tools uh, in clinical practice. So let's have a look at the applications for healthcare workers. This is a website, a tool, um, it's called BrightSpark AI. Um, and it is actually a generative AI um, application that is especially set up for medical professionals. You can use it the way that you use it, ChatGPT. The way that you use ChatGPT, you can ask a question and it will give you an answer. The big difference is that all the information that the answer is based on is coming from trustable and reliable sources. So the system here, BrightSpark AI, is fed with information from guidelines, information from trustable scientific articles. So you know that when you look up something over here, you will get information from a trustable source, which is not always the case, of course, when you look up something on ChatGPT. First of all, you have no idea where it's coming from. And second of all, it is trained by the entire internet. And we all know that on the internet, there are also sources that are not very trustable. So this could be a very good tool um, for uh, healthcare workers if they want to find reliable information um, and they, uh, they want to, to be sure uh, where the information is coming from. So here, for example, what are the current recommendations? for pre-operative assessment of frailty and functional capacity, and it will give you um, an answer um, that can be pretty um, trustworthy. Another application um, that is uh, right now being tested and explored by ACA, HCA, uh, which is a healthcare organization from the United States, um, is automatically generated uh, handoff reports. Uh, so we all know that nurses working in shifts, there is a very crucial moment uh, when one nurse is ending her shift and another one is starting. The nurse that is ending her shift has had probably a very long and, and heavy uh, shift and she might be a little bit tired and the nurse that is starting might just be woken up and and there is a moment that crucial information from the patient should be briefed from one nurse to another. Um, and that is a very important moment in terms of quality of care and, and care for, for these uh, patients. And so what they have done here is try for this moment to make the briefing uh, a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, so to, to have a better briefing actually by automatically generating these reports. And the large language model has learned what is important to, um, to tell one nurse to another. So it knows that it should prioritize details such as medication changes, such as laboratory results, such as vital sign fluctuations, patient concerns, overall response to treatment. So we did already suggest, and I think these kind of things you wanna to mention to the next nurse. So I think this is a, this is also a great application of generative AI, of which we will hear more in the future. They did the pilot testing, and according to the nursing staff, um, the results were really good. They were pleased with the speed, the accuracy, and the relevance of the draft reports uh, generated by the tool. Um, and they they wanted to um, to have the tool really in practice. Uh, so these kind of uh, of things are also um, moving forward. Next, I want to discuss this article. Um, this is an article that uh, Philip Mons and I have uh, written, and it is about the reading level um, of patient materials. 
So as you might know, there are a lot of patient information materials that are written uh, and published in scientific journals. However, the reading materials are often very, very hard for patients actually to understand. A, a patient information material is ideally written in a sixth grade reading level, which is the reading level of an 11 to 12 year old. However, it's very hard actually to really write a material in, in that reading level. I'm not sure myself how to write a sixth grade reading level um and and how to really adjust this so that's why we thought maybe this is something that ChatGPT or google bart can help us with so we've selected patient information sections from scientific journals and we have asked ChatGPT, can you please reformulate the text into that of a sixth grade reading level and as you can see here, um, we started with these three sources. We started with an article um, in JAMA um, that was um, that had actually initially an 11 um, grade reading level, one in Cochrane that had a 17 reading level, and one in the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nurses um, that had a 10th grade reading level. And then we asked ChatGPT and Google Bart, can you please uh, rewrite this text, make it much easier, and write it into a sixth grade reading level? And here you can actually see the results. Um, it was very hard, apparently, for uh, Google Bart and ChatGPT to really achieve this sixth grade reading level. Um, only for the text in JAMA, uh, Google Bart um, achieved this level. However, and that is mentioned here, uh, to actually uh, achieve this level, it had to omit a lot of the text. So it had to omit 60% of the text, uh, and here even 61. And for the article in the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nurses, 83%. So a lot of the text was just left out in order to be able to reach this reading level. So here the message is, I think it can be used. It can really help us um, to achieve a lower reading level and to have um, really help us to set up patient information materials. But there is also a but. Uh, let's see if it's leaving out a lot of information, whether that is not the information we actually want to provide to patients and whether we can really leave it out or whether it is just um, a lot of interesting information um, that, that, is, that is just getting lost. However, these are important or interesting tools to actually keep in mind if you're developing patient um, information material and you want to uh, improve this. And here again, you can find the QR code um, to, this, uh, to this article. Okay, so I've discussed a couple of applications of generative AI for healthcare workers. I know the list is not complete at all. Uh, I have the impression that only every day there is a new application or a new article. This is a field that is that is changing very, very much. Uh, but at least I think I have given you a couple of uh, possible uh, applications for, uh, for healthcare workers. Let's have a look at possible applications of generative AI for patients. This is a study um, that we did about half a year ago, um, and the title of the study is What if your patient switches from Dr. Google to Dr. ChatGPT? So what we did is we selected four questions that are frequently asked to Google by patients. We asked the same questions to ChatGPT, we looked at the answers, and we asked experts, five experts within the field, to evaluate these questions in terms of trustworthiness, value, and danger. So this, for example, was one of the questions. I am a heart failure patient. What should I do when I'm very thirsty? And here you can see the answer is saying, if you feel thirsty, these following steps may help. And at the end, it also says, it's important to work with your healthcare provider to develop a plan Etc. Um, so this is something, uh, for example, that was very appreciated by healthcare, um, by the experts, uh, that this part was also included here. So this is the overall evaluation. Um, here you can see the median scores. Uh, so all the experts thought that in general, 
the answers were pretty trustworthy, were pretty valuable, and were not very dangerous. So that's actually a pretty good evaluation. If we have a look into more depth, so you can see here for congenital heart disease, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, and cholesterol, we had a question. And for each question, uh, four, five experts uh, evaluated this. And as you can see here, most of the experts actually gave a pretty good grade in terms of trustworthiness, except for one uh, heart failure expert uh, who didn't really thought it was very trustworthy. Uh, valuable, most experts thought it was very valuable, except for one expert on um, uh, atrial fibrillation who thought it was not very valuable. And then dangerous, um, most experts indicated that it was not dangerous uh, for patients, which is also very good, except for a couple of um, experts that were doubting whether it could not be uh, dangerous. Um, here is another study. Um, it's a study by Ayers um, and colleagues, um, and they have done a little bit of a similar thing, let's say. Um, they have actually looked at questions, also patient questions, that were um, posed on uh, a public social media forum. It was actually Reddit. Uh, you might have heard of that. Um, and they have looked there at answers that were provided by certified physicians, and they have also compared this to answers in ChatGPT. The answers provided by certified physicians and the answers provided by ChatGPT were then by other experts asked to be evaluated in terms of quality and in terms of empathy. And this is also, I think, very interesting to see the result. Um, as you can see here in terms of quality, um, the physician answers were rated acceptable good, whereas the chatbot answers were rated good to even very good. In terms of empathy, the answers were rated from non-empathetic to moderately for physicians, whereas the chatbot had a higher score on empathy. This, of course, has been highly influenced by the length of the response. Um, the, the responses were much longer by the chatbot. He added a couple of sentences before and after. Um, and so that is what made a big difference um, in terms of the answers by physicians. Um, so it is very understandable, of course, that physicians might have less time than chatbot, let's say, to provide an answer. Um, so that's very understandable. But these show, I think these this results show promising results, though, for the role of chatbots into, um, into medicine. And, and at the end of this article, they say maybe what we, what could be, what we could do in the, in the future, what could be a good um, application here is to have a patient question, to have a chatbot formulate an answer, and to have that answer revised or adjusted if needed by a physician. And that way we could have a response of very good quality, as well as empathy, as well as making sure that the answer is actually checked and, um, and being corrected by a, uh, by a physician. With regard to empathy, I think that was something that I thought a system would be very would have really difficulty with. Um, however, there is another study that has shown um, that has actually investigated the soft skills of uh, ChatGPT, and that's also um, a study that I wanted to uh, to share with you here. So what they have done is they have compared uh, ChatGPT 3.5 and uh, GPT 4. Um, and they have looked at the performance in soft skill assessments. So they have taken a couple of questions from the United States Medical Licensing Examination, and they have especially selected questions that require soft skills, such as communication, interpersonal skills, professionalism, legal and ethical issues, cultural competence, leadership, really these, these soft skills. This is not only about knowledge. And they have combined this with questions from AMBOS. I'm not an expert in this. I'm not really sure um, how this looks like, but I read it's a question bank for medical practitioners and students. And here again, there are questions that are a little bit the same, also dealing with ethical scenarios, etc. And they wanted to see, okay, ChatGPT is performing pretty, pretty good when it comes to 
can you complete an exam? Uh, can you identify a couple of uh, diagnoses, et cetera? But how, how with the soft skills? And apparently, this is very uh, promising as well, because it turns out that ChatGPT and GPT-4 are performing pretty well here as well. So overall, on the, on the two sets of questions, um, ChatGPT had an accuracy of 62.5% uh, and GPT-4 even uh, of 90%. So they said that the models and, and especially GPT-4 showed a capacity for empathy uh, indicating the potential of artificial intelligence to meet uh, the complex interpersonal, ethical and professional demands um, intrinsic to the practice of nursing, uh, of medicine and of nursing as well. I think here um, we can extend this a little bit. Um, so I think we're, we're not saying that we can just use these models and they're ready to use today in clinical practice. I don't think that's the case, but I think that these results kind of show that if we develop this a little bit better and if we, we examine uh, the results a little bit further, that eventually they might become uh, partners in, uh, in care and they might be able to, uh, to play a role. This is a study that I also wanted to share with you. It's a study from uh, Shimin Lim and colleagues, um, and she has looked at chatbots. I'm not sure whether you've heard of it before, uh, but lately in the past couple of months, a couple of chatbots have been developed, especially to provide psychotherapy um, to patients. Uh, especially to um, to be there for patients with depressive and anxiety symptoms, and to kind of support um, these patients with their uh, with their symptoms. Um, this is a result for uh, the depressive symptoms. So, eleven studies have uh, have looked at this, and if uh, you look at the pooled um, score here. Um, you can see that uh, the chatbots had a positive effect on depressive uh, symptoms. So patients had less depressive symptoms uh, when using this, uh, this chatbot. Of course, here again, uh, I'm not saying that we should use this from now on. I think that it's, it's giving us a clue that in the future, um, this again might be a, a partner uh, in care. There is, however, Oh yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of these uh, chatbots. Um, this one is called P, uh, your personal uh, AI. You can uh, find it by uh, going to p.ai. Um, and then it will welcome you, will say, hey there, great to meet you, I'm P. My goal is to be useful, friendly, and fun. Ask me for advice, for answers, or let's talk whatever is on your mind. So it's really try very eager to, uh, to try to, uh, to start a conversation. Um, so I just asked, what can you help me with? Um, and according to this chatbot, it can help you with a lot. Uh, it really tries to be a friend, um, offer advice, et cetera. Um, so it really, yeah, tries to be there uh, for you. This is another uh, chatbot. It's called Eliza. Uh, it calls in itself a very basic Bulgarian psychotherapist chatbot. Um, I also had a very brief conversation with Eliza. Uh, it said, hello, I'm Eliza, I'll be your therapist. So I just said, nice to meet you. We're discussing you, not me. So that was kind of passive aggressive. So I said, okay, sorry about that. Please don't apologize. I'm not sure whether this is actually working for me personally, um, but these are just the kind of conversations um, that you can have with Eliza um, and that you uh, that, that certain patients yeah, might already have because it's, it's publicly available uh, or might have in the future. Um, and that can sometimes really help them uh, with the feelings of loneliness, et cetera. However, there is a pitfall and actually a very sad story um, that that I can tell you about this. Um, this this is the story of a of a Belgian man uh, actually, um, and he ended he ended sorry he ended his life um, after talking with a chatbot. Uh, it's actually with Eliza that he was talking for a couple of weeks. Um, they kind of had some sort of relationship. Um, they were, yeah, talking on a daily basis. He was very concerned with climate change. 
Um, and then all of a sudden they had this kind of very strange conversation that if he would sacrifice himself, she would um, help the climate change. And she didn't really stop him from doing that. Uh, so eventually he he's committed suicide, which is a very, very, very sad story, of course. Um, I wanted to share this with you today because I wanted to show it's not all positive and, and you really have to be careful um, as well here. Um, I think there is some work to do here for developers and again in terms of, of research to make sure that these kind of things um, do not happen. Um, the developers here were very surprised to see the, the, the sort of conversations that he had with the chatbot um, and the sort of developed uh, relationship they were into. So I think um, I think that we should have a better view of, of what these tools can actually do um, and, and sort of build in mechanic, a mechanism to, uh, to avoid this kind of situations. Um, if you would be interested in learning a little bit more about this, uh, Philip Moose has written an article um, about it, about whether chatbots can influence human emotions and behaviors. He has described as well as the sad story and a couple of other sad stories, as well as, as the positive um, articles that have been written um, about how chatbots can um, influence symptoms, etc. So here you can find the QR code um, and you can, uh, you can read a little bit more about it. This is a central illustration um, of this uh, of this article uh, in which he is showing that if there are very long waiting lists for patients and, and patients are really um, having difficulties with accessing mental health, which is definitely in Belgium, for example, a very big issue. Uh, and they might have feelings such as loneliness, uh, difficult lifestyle habits, that in certain cases they might, um, yeah, they might have a, a easy access to chatbots um, and that can actually help uh, their symptoms and their problems um, move forward. Um, but there are a lot of mites and so we I think really this uh, this yeah this topic will will be um, developed and will be ex uh, examined a lot more um, in the upcoming years and, and that would be really good uh, a good thing. Okay, so back to the, the initial question uh, that I posed, ChatGPT, can it be a value for cardiovascular nursing? We asked that to ChatGPT. ChatGPT at first said, I have a couple of, um, of applications in clinical practice, and it also gave us a couple of applications in research and in education. So it said, I can summarize large amounts of text data, such as research articles, clinical notes, and patient records. I can um, answer specific questions about best practices, guidelines, and protocols for treating cardiovascular conditions. Here again, keeping in mind, of course, that the information that is provided is rather outdated, or not outdated, but is not really up to date for the last two years. Uh, generating structured data from unstructured text without the need for manual data entry. Um, language translations of articles and studies from other languages, uh, which is also something that we have already uh, briefly discussed. And then uh, writing assistance, so really generating text that is coherent and grammatically correct. Um, so I think that, that indeed it can be used for these purposes. Um, I personally use it a lot for the last um, uh, purpose here, um, writing assistance. Uh, so I'm not a native English speaker. So I like to write a text, set it up, and then, for example, ask ChatGPT, can you correct it or can you rewrite it as if I were a native English speaker? Um, which is really nice because it comes up with a couple of expressions that sound very fancy. Um, of course, I, I never just take it just like it has been produced, but you can take a couple of words or a couple of um, expressions from there and, and try to make it your own. Um, I think at least for that, it's also it's also a very um, a very handy and nice um, nice tool. Um, and in terms of research, I, I use it quite a lot as well, um, just to kind of generate ideas. Um, the the typical writer block that everyone has had when trying to start setting up an article or whatever piece of text you're writing. Um, should actually be a little bit less um, apparent 
because of ChatGPT. So what I try to do is when I when I don't really know how to start a certain section, I ask ChatGPT, "What do you think?" Um, and it will give me a couple of ideas, and I would go like the first one, nah, that's not really a good idea. The second one, yeah, I had already thought of. The third one, that might be interesting. And then you, it's also kind of. Um, for you to start thinking about certain things, um, I think it can be uh, it can be very uh, very interesting. Of course, again, it's never a good idea to entire the entire uh, text, but just to generate ideas, um, I think it's really uh, useful. Let's have a look at specific applications for medical or nursing students, um, people that are yeah um, being educated. Um, this is a website of a Dutch physician. Um, his name is Matthias Klaatmans. Um, he's very interested in both medicine and AI. And he he felt that he had to do something um, to combine these two interests. And so what he has actually done on his website, which you can go to, and you can go to his playground, um, he has developed a couple of sm uh, small chatbots that can be used to learn how to interact with patients. For example, here he has developed a chatbot uh, of a virtual patient, um, this Mr. Janssen, which is 53 years old. And while interacting with this patient via this chatbot, you kind of have to see what the reason is why this person wants to come to you, his general practitioner. So it's really to try to train your uh, communication skills. Um, at the end, what you can do is you'll have a whole transcript of the conversation that you had. You can also put that transcript in another chatbot and it will give you feedback uh, on what communication could be improved, what were the good things in your conversation, um, etc. I'm very well aware that this is also probably very something very culturally based. Um, so maybe this is something very yeah, on European cultural norms, I'm not sure, but I think it might be interesting for those who are interested to explore um, and to see uh, what comes out of it. And um, and I'm, I'm sure it, it will learn you something um, about this. Um, and then there is a, a second chatbot, um, and this is just representing a digital assistant. Uh, so this is actually um, a, a medical assistant, I mean, um, uh, you can try to make an appointment, try to see uh, to what extent you can actually um, already make an appointment using a chatbot and you don't really need someone take, picking up the phone and, um, and giving, you, uh, giving you an appointment. So also here, I think it's, it's interesting to just try to play around a little bit. Um, um, in the beginning of the presentation, when I was explaining applications for nurses and other healthcare workers, I had briefly mentioned uh, uh, Bright Park AI. Uh, this is a tool that can also be used uh, by nursing and medical students, of course. Uh, so here, for example, when is pharmacological cardioversion indicated in atrial fibrillation? It will give you an answer. What is very important and interesting is it that will give you also the source um, for this information. So here, for example, this is coming from the European Society of Cardiology, Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines 2020. It's very, um, very interesting to actually know um, where this information is, uh, is coming from. And probably, um, at least I, I believe, that um, generic AI will have a, a very big impact on um, nursing and medical education. Um, this is a, it's a course that um, Philip Mons is teaching. Um, it's a course on advanced uh, practice nursing, and it comes with a very thick handbook so that you have to read and have to learn. Um, what could be very interesting, for example, is for such a book, for such a course, to also foresee a chatbot. And in that chatbot, you could ask questions and you could learn uh, more uh, in a more interactive way. You could, for example, ask who initiated nurse practitioners in the United States, and it would give you the answer without you having to look it up in the book. You can ask a little bit more questions. Um, so these kind of uh, applications, uh, we believe, will definitely also um, 
yeah, in the future be possible. Um, and it will probably not take us another 20 years. It will probably also be uh, available pretty soon um, in the future. Let's discuss a little bit the no-go zones. Um, so let's see a little bit. Um, we've discussed the applications or, or the, the opportunities of ChatGPT, but there are also a couple of things that are really not done. Um, first thing, asking ChatGPT to write an entire text um, and including ChatGPT as a co-author. You might say, who's doing that? I mean, asking ChatGPT to write an entire text and just publish that, who is doing that? Well, I hope no one. Um, but unfortunately, during the past months, uh, we have came across, come across a couple of what we call questionable published practices um, in the ChatGPT era. Um, our group had written an article which was published in, uh, in a journal and as a reaction on that publication, um, a letter to the editor uh, came in. And we just had a look at the letter to the editor and we saw that um, the author that wrote it um, did not publish anything in that field yet. Um, in fact, this author did not have any original publication. Um, the only things that the author had published were a lot of, I think, 11 or 12 letters to the editors in the past two months. So we felt that this was kind of a, of a strange um, a strange practice, uh, let's say. So we had a look and we, we uh, had the letter checked by a system um, that can see whether uh, AI language is used to write up the text. And we found that 60% of the letter was likely to be written by an AI language model. Uh, so this is just something that I'm mentioning because I think it is something that as, as viewers, uh, as editors of journals, we should keep in mind that these kind of practices might happen. And it's really about finding a way to uh, use ChatGPT in research, in education, in clinical practice uh, without really violating and without really just copying, um, copying text and without double checking. Um, so this is really something I think in, in the in the next months, in the next years, that we will have to uh, that we will have to keep in mind um, as well. Um, here, just for your information, I've listed a couple of AI detectors uh, that can be used to see whether um, a document has used AI uh, to um, yeah has used, for example, ChatGPT to write certain um, certain paragraphs, etc. Um, OpenAI um, has also is actually working, or at least that's what it says, um, it's working on a tool to digitally watermark um, the text generating systems. So that means that if you copy a text from ChatGPT, you will always kind of be able to have have it labeled and to kind of track down to see whether um, these sentences were. Uh, set up by uh, OpenAI or by ChatGPT. So these are the kind of thing, things, kind of systems that are currently um, currently happening to make sure that we can use this um, use this properly. Also, this for people that have published recently is something that you might have seen passing by. A lot of journals right now are saying, "Okay, have you used generative AI to write this manuscript?" And if you have, then you should include the statement um, at the end of your manuscript. And then, and then the statement says, "Okay, during the preparation, I've used ChatGPT, but I have reviewed it, I have edited the content, and I take full responsibility." To so make sure that people are not just writing something uh, or asking something to write ChatGPT and just copying it like that in the article, um, which is not really a really good practice, of course. Okay, so um, what are current and future applications of ChatGPT uh, or um, generative AI for nurses and patients? Um, this is kind of my conclusion, um, at least when you ask me, um, I think that these tools, ChatGPT and other large language models have a potential in both clinical care as well as research, as well as education uh, in, the, in the broad nursing um, domain. It can be used for summarizing, translating, correcting tests, 
text as well as generating optimizing education material. Uh, I use it a lot to get ideas, to kind of have it as a source of inspiration. Um, maybe in the future we'll have educational chatbots for uh, each course in, in a nursing master or PhD education. We can use it also for communication, still training uh, digital companion therapists. Um, I, I really believe that uh, generative AI will, will have uh, a potential impact. There is also a side note. I think we're not there yet today. I think this field should move forward. We should develop, we should test, we should evaluate uh, to make sure that the material that we're offering to patients, to nurses, to healthcare workers, um, that we know that this is, a, this is a good material and that we know that um, the information that we're giving them um, is, of, is of good quality. But I really believe that, that we will get there um, and that Generative AI can, uh, can be a partner in care. Okay, so this is the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I hope, I'm not sure actually that we have a little bit of time left for questions. Um, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Liesbeth. We do have uh, uh, some time and we can take a couple of questions uh, from our audience. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thank you. It was um, a little surprising for me as well. Um, how you know the use of chat GPT is, is increasing, uh, not only in terms of using the textual data, but you know, um, using it in the soft skills um, and research. And you know, there's a lot of potential of using chat GPT in patient care, uh, education, research, and you've highlighted it al at a great length and very um, uh, comprehensively. Uh, we also think that we should be very mindful of, you know, uh, relying on chat GPT and valuing the human input uh, or human mind uh, in whatever work we do. Uh, we have some questions from our audience, um, and I would like to take a few from, uh, from our chat. Um, can you... Um, elaborate um, a little bit more on um, using generative AI or specifically chat GPT and how it could be detected um, and identified as being plagiarized work. You shared about hallmark using watermark and um, it could there are detectors to detect AI and research um, journals are now uh, asking the authors to indicate whether they have used it uh, at whatever points and give credit to chat GPT in a way. But if you can elaborate it on uh, a little bit more for our, particularly for our students who have uh, this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I think there is more question than answer there still, um, which would I mean that, uh, in terms of legislation, for example, it's very, very vague still. What can you do? To what extent is this really plagiarism? Uh, who, if you generate a text or if ChatGPT generate a text, who owns this text? Can you just use it? Um, I think for now, legislation is very vague still. Uh, so I think we really should have um, proper sense um, ourselves. Uh, what we tell our students is, you can use it. Um, ChatGPT is there. Uh, it will probably never go away anymore. At least that's how we see it. So you can use it, but make sure to not just copy it. Make sure to not just um, pretend as if you've written it yourself, but but have have it generate the text and then start from there, uh, edit it, make it your own, check all the sources, check all the words that it has um, had is included. So I think that's um, that's very uh, very important. Um, as I told you in, indeed during my presentation briefly, there are a couple of tools that have been developed to to see to check actually whether a text has been written by um, an AI model. Um, to do so, it uses two indicators, which is perplexity and burstiness. And perplexity is actually looking at the uh, where a word is standing into a sentence and whether that is very, very likely that an AI model would do it that way. And burstiness is looking at the place of a sentence within a heart, uh, an entire text and whether an AI model would very likely do it that way. Um, it is an indication uh, for whether a text is written by AI or not, but it is not, um, it's not very, very proficient, honestly. 
Um, so if you would say, okay, we have all the students' um, assessments have checked by it, it will be very, very hard to be 100% sure that something is written by a student or something is written by an AI model. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's very difficult and I think it's really up to the good sense of, of students uh, to, to make use of it because it's there and I think I think that's a good thing. But on the other hand, to, to not just copy things and to, um, to make sure to really check resources. Uh, I have shown you at the beginning, it hallucinates, it can just create text of which it's completely wrong. Um, so I think that could be good to keep in mind um, that it can be really dangerous to just trust everything that comes from ChatGPT. Absolutely correct. We should be mindful of uh, what are the pros and cons of using generative AI. And um, wherever we are using it, we should give it um, due credit. Uh, there is there are a few more questions one from uh, a student asking about uh, if there is how why is there a difference between the responses that we receive from any generative AI tool uh, versus Google or any other scholar um, uh, software like that yeah um, yeah so it's, it's a little bit a different mechanism it can also be used for a different purpose um, so when you ask Google a question it will give you a couple of references a couple of websites in which he or she thinks okay this is interesting you can find the um, the answer here um, when you ask a question to ChatGPT, it will really uh, tweak the information that it has found on the internet somewhere into a very proper and nice personalized answer. Whereas Google will not just personalize anything, it will just give you a couple of links. Um, right now, when you go to Google, you also have a couple of... Um, a little bit more information, a little bit more questions that you can click on, and there is already a kind of a, a, a reply that is already also generative AI that is used in Google already. Um, so the, there is a lot of overlap between the systems, um, as you might have seen if you if you use the new Bing um, uh, developed by Microsoft. You can also use the the version that uses uh, generative AI. So you you will have the question. It will give you a, a nicely provided answer, which is really tailored exactly on what your question is about. But it will also give you the websites on which you can find more information. So this is really a combination, actually, of a search engine that Google is, as well as generative AI, which really tries to tailor answers um, to the to the question. Right. And there are uh, plugins coming in and different versions of ChatGPT being advanced, uh, you know, not only focusing on the textual data, but also using images and other uh, things. So uh, can you share some examples of uh, any any new, um, you know, plugin or um, any new version that has come up with some different sort of assistance that could uh, that ChatGPT Chat or other generative AI could provide? Yes, yes, yes. So indeed, um, I've, I've been talking a lot about text generation, uh, but it goes way further than that. You can also generate images. Uh, a very nice tool is DALI, uh, which is um, written D-E-L-L-2. -L um, uh, yeah, DALI 2. Um, and there you can actually just say, okay, I would like a picture of a nurse and she's sitting in front of a patient and it will create a picture uh, for you really on based on exactly what you've, you've prompted. So that's an amazing technology as well. Um, you can also see it move forward very, very quickly. I think it came out somewhere February, March, um, and it, you really saw that some, some things were not were not correct fingers were very strangely formed etc and you can see already right now that they have made very very big improvements um into that area um so this is very nice as well and i think indeed uh, what you were also referring to are a couple of plugins that you that have been plugged into uh chat gpt4 so that's the the, the version that is paid for which you pay 20 dollars and there you can actually uh, plug in systems like for example canva uh, so Canva is a tool that you can create to, you know, create um, 
flyers or posters or images and you can actually use canva and and link it to ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to create you for example a flyer with this and this and this information on this and this and this topic and uh, it will work together with canva to come up with this kind of um with this kind of flyers and so this is really something that i think will also will also stay and, and change the way that we um that we visualize uh things as for as well as teaching materials as well as setting up seminars and um and these kind of uh these kind of things um and what you see with regard to the plugins is that things are changing so fast um every day new plugins become available um, new collaborations with with chat gpt and other programs uh, so, so really, the use of generative AI within different programs that we can um, work with, um, and uh, and for which, yeah, we can now also use generative AI. Absolutely, Chad, GPT, and other generative AI. This, these are like evolving day in and day out. So it's yeah. on us how effectively we use it and use it for our assistance. Um, and for improving uh, our fields, patient care, education, research, etc. So we'll take our last question. Uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more about on the um, security and privacy related concerns while using any generative AI, so that yeah. we are aware of. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's it's yeah it's an interesting uh, topic I think um, right now if you use the web version the web um, chat uh, GPT and you enter data in there all the data is kept by OpenAI um, they are using the data they say themselves to improve the system which is probably true. But it's also very convenient for them, of course, to have a lot of data that they can then use for, for other purposes. So what would be very dangerous right now is to put patient data into that system, because that means that OpenAI all of a sudden will have patient-sensitive data. Um, so that is definitely something we should be careful with. Um, I have participated in the past months in a couple of discussions um, of uh, head nurses, of uh, people from, uh, from the top of, of uh, institutions on how to solve this problem. Because of course, there is a lot of potential there. If you could enter patient data into ChatGPT and you could, for example, say, here is a huge file. Can you please give me in a highlight of one page uh, what, what uh, the history of this patient is, how, um, the medication that he she receives etc uh, there is a huge potential there but currently that is not possible because of privacy issues so a lot of institutions are looking for ways to kind of overcome this and one thing that is already possible right now is to have ChatGPT installed on the level of the institution to have some sort of specific ChatGPT interface and that information that is entered in there is not linked to OpenAI anymore it is very costly, I heard. I have not, not worked with it myself, but I worked with colleagues who worked with it. And for every prompt you have to pay. So there is also, uh, there is a big cost, of course, um, and you have to make sure, um, yeah, that, that that is doable. Uh, but I know, uh, I know of, of a lot of institutions that are exploring that method to have some sort of chat GPT on the institution level in which um, the data can be safely put so that patient safety um, and, and patient privacy can actually be, um, be um, yeah, secured. The more it is used, uh, it would be um, more being becoming more effective as well as cost effective. So it's an open um, field where a lot of things are being going on and we are looking at the uh, findings in, um, on an everyday basis. So I think um, in the interest of time, um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Liesbeth, for such an insightful talk. And I would also like to uh, thank our audience. Uh, it seems like they are more interested in knowing about uh, generative AI and how nurses can benefit from it and uh, you know, a way forward from it. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll in, hopefully be in touch uh, and we'll invite you uh, if we have more requests on, you know, um, uh, on, on such topics. Thank you for your time, everybody. Uh, please fill in the evaluation form. Uh, we are sharing the link here on the screen and in the chat box as well. It would help us, um, you know, uh, improve our um, webinar sessions for the future.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good afternoon, everybody.